Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actor, artist, Billy Zane, and novelist, Joseph Matson. Artist, actor, Billy Zane was born and raised in Chicago. He studied a year in Lugano, Switzerland, before graduating from high school back in Chicago. I think he took time off to look at Hollywood and never looked back. Is that what happened? That is what happened. How did you know that you wanted to act? I grew up in a very theatrical family. Um, it was in the DNA, as we are Greek, uh, but um, my parents were doing uh, regional theater in Chicago. Oh, they were? Yeah, I grew oh, so up watching them on stage in the, you know, in, the, in the 70s, and they were doing it since, gosh, early 60s. Oh, so you and your sister both? Yeah. And, uh, we're in the theater. Uh, we're in the theater. My, my <laughs> aunt taught theater at my high school. I, there were, and I wanted to be a filmmaker there were, and, and a painter, but there were enough uh, actors in the family. It was like the last thing the family needed was another you know, kid on the board. So. No, but you were. You made 80 films. So uh, <laughs> among those 80, Dead Calm, Back to the Future, Critters, uh, The Phantom, and of course, Titanic. Of course. Of course. <laughs> what were your favorites, oh, yeah. actually, among 80? I don't know. You um, have favorites? I, I do, and they're often not the, uh, well, favorites as defined in, you know, which category? Favorite experiences, uh, favorite movies, favorite end product. Often uh, your favorite experiences, you know, make terrible films in the end. But they have good stories. But they've got good stories. <laughs> and do you use those stories in your artwork? Um, no, I just use my time off in, you know, in the creation of the artwork. Yeah. Many of them were made on location. I was wondering about that. Let's go back just a little bit. Sure. So say favorite director. Uh, to, to, you know, to choose. Let's, let's make that plural to be to Yeah, be fair. exactly. Um, Philip Noyce, James Cameron, Sally Potter. Oh, um, right. Fantastic. They're actually, MoMA uh, is doing a, uh, a retrospective of her work uh, in July and they're, right? re they're re releasing Orlando and screening oh. it with Hilda. And I just remembered, thank God you asked because I've got No, they did because I, I did get a notice that. of that. They've re they're, they're bringing it back. Yeah. There's a big party in New York next month, which I note to self. Make, yes, um, it's true. Go. And they said that the film and the color and everything looks fantastic it's now. It's phenomenal. It, better, really, than yeah, it was? Yeah, better. And that's it's held stretch. up. It's, so um, it's something that's held up. So that's, is it MoMA in New York? Yes. Yeah. Um, the uh, production design team on that uh, were, were a, a, a Dutch group. I can't remember their name. They're brilliant, but they did all of Peter Greenaway's films. Oh, who, who, and, you know, so, so moving. It's so yeah. lush uh, yeah. what they can provide, and they did amazing work on that budget. And that was that was a lush film. Mm. So so the things that you're talking about, Peter Greenway and Orlando, are like very artistically um, relevant. Sure pieces but also lush and painterly they are and that so maybe that's why you like it I could it could very well be um you know I, I like uh, in terms of the lush settings I'm a you know I'm a citizen for maximalism as yeah. much as minimalism um, <laughs> well when you're on the set do you have time to paint or do you draw or what do you do you have time to solve a, you know, a <laughs> gulf crisis and a uh, you know balance the budget it there's you know, there's lots of time. Lots of time. Also. So what do you do? Can you use your hotel room or a trailer? Or I like working what do you outside. Do? I like I like working with what is, whatever's whatever's available, and that that's indicative in the in the work itself, from materials to the exercise. I, I try not to travel with anything. And oh, is I, that right? Yeah. And then I, how do you come back with stuff? I ship it, or oh. in this case of my last kind of journey on uh, on the road in Europe, I, I stopped at my favorite art store, the local hardware store, or marine supply, or shipyard, or whatever Whatever you serves. can find, is that right? Yeah. Not an art store. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it's too delicate. Uh, I, uh, and I get my boat paint, or my... Oh, heavy-duty stuff. 
Yeah, primer and uh, some mixed medium, and some oil based or acrylic, or you know, some gloss, some matte. And then um, if I can't find canvas, I'll use uh, sails from Marine Supply, which or is a great logical. canvas. Yeah. Or um, in this case, I, I, I opted for something that would travel light in rolls, which was shelf liner. I found in Nice. I went to the Cannes Film Festival and spent most of the time up in Saint Paul de Vence at the. At, <laughs> it's so know, great in the square there. Oh, it's lovely, and at the Column d'Or, which has right. arguably the best collection of you know modern Which, works, and right. incredible. Um, but uh, I, I I found this fantastic. Um, it was gray, mm. almost plastic with uh, with I'm sure a synthetic kind of canvas you can feel on the back. These rolls of oh. uh, of shelf liner and then white, which is a little closer to paper. And I'd chop them off and paint and roll. Think them Picasso off. did that? He must have. I don't know what. I, <laughs> he I must have if he was it. in the same area. <laughs> <laughs> no. Matisse cutting out little pieces like Could that. Very well be. You know, whatever you find in the neighborhood. <laughs> yes, know. especially what you're saying. It sounds like there was a canvasy back to it. It seemed to be, but like I, I preferred the plastic <laughs> front. I mean, that was uh, uh, strangely what came, what I ended up using. I was just going to ask you about all the locations. You had a lot of locations filming, mm. and does it? Um, influence the work other than finding great hardware stores? Or <laughs> um, in in the very uh, you know kind of DNA of the place, uh, as if you know I like again I like to work outside. I like a sense of space, and I was doing some of the pieces in, on the island of uh, Paros in Greece. Oh, so there, and you know the watery, the, the wind, watery, sandy, and, sandy. And, and and a lot of the petras, the rocks. Uh, so a wind would kick up, the painting would flip. Little stones would adhere, and I said, "Of course, that's what I intended. That's a fabulous element." Fantastic, to though, isn't it? Yeah. Because you have to go with what's happening. You deal with what is. Exactly. And that's You've been painting a long time, obviously. Did you ever take art classes? Um, only in I think grade school, and is nothing that, formal. How do you get like the sense of space and like this piece right here? This has a figure in it. Mm. It has a sense of something else going on here. But you have this kind of ghost-like feel to it. And <laughs> tell me. How did I how did I arrive at that? that how did I arrive tell at that? Tell me because it's great. Um, it, it, there was a, basically the ghost-like effect came as a result of the 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 brush. Um, uh, leaving quite a bit of its <laughs> but this uh, is white paint linen, over on this it? side, yeah. and then uh, it was easier to play to play with the illusion and highlights of a figure with uh, uh, with a brush that was um, not laden with paint. Um, I was surprised to find uh, the figurine that was present. I think it was the bun and the head that provided, and then I just went with a body shape, and then it turned into some kind of almost you know retro servile you know. Uh, in, in like flint, you know, expression I of the it. female, which is completely in contrast with my views of the goddess, but it was certainly a, a guilty pleasure. In but you didn't have the goddess uh, posing for you. Um, not in, in that photo, but in the, in certainly in some of the others, she of was, you know, more than willing. You've, you've, you're working with Laurie Frank, who's in Bergamot Station. Mm. Your show is there. How many pieces are going to be in it? Um, there'll be nine uh, um, in the show. Will this be in the that show? That will be. I Tell think. us what this about this piece. Um, this one's called Cleaning Agent. Uh, for the you know, I. I you have to name them. Of I course. did, and I and <laughs> I didn't put that much thought into it. I, I don't paint with intention of. Uh, let me rephrase that. The act there is intention in the act, but I don't paint with concept in mind. So the naming was an afterthought and, pure, and, and referenced the, uh, one of the ingredients or elements, uh, which was 409 cleaner. So, Is that right? Yeah, and that's what, you know, the oil at work interacting with the uh, uh, acrylic created this strange kind of porous chemical reaction where it would bleed through. And then I was reducing it and then spraying it with this, you know, I don't use it in the house. I use I use very you know like 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 uh, apple cider vinegar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so I went I wanted something really toxic and right. uh, hardcore. So I went with the old. But do you think oil. about archival, uh, the lasting of these things? Are these uh, elements archival? They're chemical. Of course, they're going to be here forever. Are they going to be because well, we can't get rid of <laughs> them? Oh, rid you're, of right, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Uh, Although I painted in Africa, I was using <laughs> soil. So hopefully that'll stick around. Yeah, that's what you said. You picked up pieces of soil. 
the, the lumps earth, of I was, earth. I was there for maybe three weeks doing a film, and um, outside, about an hour outside of Johannesburg, and uh, the soil had this amazing uh, red clay quality, oh, and I'm yeah. sure it was mineral rich, and uh, and uh, we would get frequent uh, flash floods and hailstorms, so it turned, you know, it would liquefy for a minute and then harden again, and while it would Is liquefy, that right? it was that fast? I'd collect it, and then. Um, I started working with it on canvas. It was beautiful, and it dried in the same. It didn't fade. Uh, I thought it would fade in its color. The pigment stayed. It was that cool. African uh, mud cloth. They use that, and the yeah. color stays, That's doesn't right. it? Yeah. A very good, Billy. <laughs> that was good I, material. Of course, I planned it. That's exactly what I was intending. The you know, you've worked African with a lot. Of, <laughs> you've worked with a lot of directors, mm. and Laurie Frank is the director Quite of right. the gallery. Do gallery owners or, or uh, directors have any say-so in what you're doing? Does Do, she direct you in any way, or does she just take the art that you bring? Um, she, it, it, she is an artist uh, in her own right um, by through her selection. Um, her her very oh, but her incredible her eye. eye allows to. Well, you know, I think in any it's kind of contextual. I think in modern in in, in these times. Artists are, you know, you can make art from your selection. It's like um, making a compilation tape for a lover. I you see. Know, these yeah. are not, I didn't create this music, but this combination of music exactly. and this sequence, these playlists, if you will, right. uh, are indicative of my sensibilities. So when she selects what canvas is out of, you know, out of your out whole of body the of pantheon work. of, you know, new work, she, uh, she, um, she is, you know, there's Laurie in the show. It's like the, exactly. she, she found a through line. That was her taste, and I love letting her, you know, uh, bring her voice and eye to it. And then in the hanging as well. You in know. the hanging, in the installation. Do you have a studio at, in L.A.? Or, um, I mean, in, I, I, in L.A.? In, behind my home, yeah. <laughs> you have, so you I've have a studio. i converted my garage. And, and I, again, I, I'm quite... I like working outdoors. I take. Uh, oh, that's right. You're plein air. You I, like to be out. In I, the... I go out uh, to different locations, and because I work on the, uh, these are uh, unique in that they're actually on canvas, stretched, mm -hmm. framed. In this Let's case. hold this one too. Um, and I'm uh, hold this one up. Thank you. Uh, mo most of the time, I work on um, on large canvas, on the ground, unstretched, um, and I end up calling them skins because they, based on the amount of paint, they 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 take on almost a a skin-like quality, and they're um, often uneven. And I've and mounted. And this is very thick. Mm. This and what'd you name this? I don't remember. Oh. And we don't have a name on the back, <laughs> well, but, but it's so heavy it's gone through the canvas to the back Has side, it really? too. Um, when you're in the studio, do you listen to music? Do you need music when you're working or um, solitude? Uh, it depends. Uh, I like it. I enjoy listening to music um, all the time, really. I carry uh, little portable speakers in my... Uh, with the gun Pandora. I ride my bicycle quite a bit, so I've hooked up a speaker system because I'm not I'm not big on the earbuds. So oh, you listen to them from your like, bike? Yeah, I just mount them on the basket and you know roll around listening to you know Stan Getz or whatever. Well, we thank you for coming. I'm grateful for being here. We thank, thank you. you for sharing your art and keep painting. I would indeed, and if you'd like to see more of them, please go to uh, oh, Lori yeah. Frank uh, Picture Galleries com. She has all of that on yeah. her on her you, site. You thank you. Through. Thank you, my dear. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Goodbye. Don't go away. We'll be right back with novelist Joe Matson. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with Joseph Matson, who writes. He writes novels, poems, screenplays, and nonfiction. Is that right? That's correct. His book, books, Eat Hell, Empty the Sun, and Courting the Jaguar are provocative and probably X-rated, wouldn't you say? Um. Approaching. Approaching. <laughs> <laughs> At least approaching. And in that approaching, <laughs> in that approaching vein, Joe's a rambler, so they say. 
along the way, he's worked as a farmer, a dishwasher, a cook, a getaway driver, that was a good one, and a healthcare aide for the mentally insane. Yeah. So now we want to know where those jobs took place. Where was the farmer? Uh, in, the, in Michigan. Um, in Michigan, southwestern like, Michigan, like we should know in yeah, Michigan. <laughs> in Michigan. Um, southwestern Michigan, uh, Van Buren County. Doing has, what? Uh, fruit farming. Is apples, that right? Cherries, yeah. From an LA boy? Uh, no, no. I, I grew up in Chicago ah. and southwestern Michigan. Ah. And then um, I traveled around the country. Um, oh, that was do, your rambling? That was my rambling days. And cooking? Cooking, uh, short order cook and greasy spoons. Um, ah. Pizza chef at high-end Italian restaurants. Um, I get that from my mother's an excellent cook. Oh, she is? Oh, so so, I, so I, that was easy. Yeah, yeah. I inherited that one. And then we have uh, the uh, dishwasher. That's pretty easy. Yeah. You can get that anywhere. But healthcare uh, pro provider? That uh, happened in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Um, Kalamazoo had at one time the most per capita, I believe, insane asylums is that right? in the country. And Were people what, sending them there all yeah, over the country? And was, when the reforms happened in the 60s, late 60s, kind of like after one flew over the cuckoo's nest, yeah. helped spark this like revolution in healthcare, um, they kind of just opened the doors. And all these people inhabited Kalamazoo. And so these organizations started group homes that were like more assisted living kind of places right. rather than the insane asylum. And I worked in various group homes there, um, just basically helping that's people fantastic. get along. Actually, that's really fantastic. I can see a lot of stories coming yeah, yeah, out yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a wealth of, um, <laughs> Wasn't it? of uh, inspiration. Yeah, yeah, all of it, from Greasy Spoon to yeah. Kalamazoo, Greasy Spoon, Kalamazoo. <laughs> wow. Did you go to school there in Michigan? Uh, I went a little bit at Western Michigan University, but I, I uh, was too wild wild for the road and, and I left and just started rambling around. Well then how did you start writing? Did you go to workshops? Uh, no, I started writing um, partially out of just a love of, of reading uh, um, is where it very Which much is started. great because usually people who don't go to school don't read very much yeah. and that's the reason you're influenced to read, right, yeah. As in, from your classes. but. So, so you had, did you have an English teacher who was great? Um, I did in high you? school, yeah. That, that definitely helped out a little bit. But I, I had been just a, a devoured books from a very young age. I got, uh, when I was six years old, a neighbor gave me um, a copy of uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. And ever since... That was that, it? That was that. That's I, yeah. so great to be able to pinpoint something. Did you take a wood shop, a workshops? Uh, wood shop. Did you take wood shop? <laughs> <laughs> I took wood shop. Did you? But go? I'm a horrible carpenter. So but what about workshops? But, but <laughs> workshops, um, I took a couple after moving to L.A. Um, I moved here 12 years ago, kind of set to settle down a little bit and focus on writing seriously. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, since I was probably... 12 or so, I've been keeping journals and writing stories oh, so and stuff like that, but I never, um, it wasn't until I was about 25 that I started seriously like sending them out for publication and stuff like that. So you did have things hidden away in your bedroom yeah. that you w wanted to have published. Yeah. How did you get the courage to do that? And did someone influence, did someone not influence, but encourage you? Um, I think I just, uh, I got tired of rambling around and I saw enough of life and realized, you know, the one thing that's consistent is the writing, and it's the one thing I do, you know, uh -huh. habitually, and I might as well make a career out of it because that's what I'm passionate about. And that's, so that's that's basically what made me start sending stuff out. So you followed your passion actually to L.A. Did you write Eat Hell first? Yeah, Eat Hell is a little collection of stories. Oh, it's a stories. collection. So um, a couple of them had been published previously in magazines, and then this is like a the collected. So there are there's, there's short stories, yeah, obviously. That's a, that's a book and of what short do they cover? Um, odd experiences in Los Angeles, um, such, uh, involving weird Skid Row hotels, and um, there's some drug stories in there. Um, I used to live downtown. I was going to ask, and, did yeah, you live downtown? I lived downtown um, bef about ten years ago. Before it, you know, it's changing quite rapidly now. Yes, it's so for quite instance, gentrified. <laughs> yeah, I used to live like right near uh, Los Angeles. Avenue and um, you know between there and Spring Street and uh -huh. that was all kind of crack alley and just 
you know. And now there's art bars. galleries. And now there's, yeah, now there's art galleries. And, <laughs> and, um, it, it, and I went down there recently, and there's actually a gallery called Crack Gallery. Oh, there is. And, <laughs> Took the name of it. Yeah, and, and I, I, it was weird at first, and then I thought, well, at least they're, they're you showing should, their roots. You <laughs> should have a book signing. Yeah, at the Crack Gallery. <laughs> the yeah. Crack Gallery. Um, when you talked about reading and reading, did you read Bukowski and Selby and Dan Fante? And um, John Fante, his father, you was read his a father. huge influence on me. Was um, it? Because he was, was very L.A. Yeah, and, and even beyond just uh, just his style and everything was, was hugely inf influential early on. Uh, Hubert Selby, of course, amazing. Um, Bukowski, the, the trouble is he was, they published every single thing he wrote, oh. and every writer is going to have, you know... The stuff that maybe nobody should see that gets you to the to the to, that to the, point. the quality stuff and so when oh, when, when Bukowski is on, I think he's incredible. I mean, you, there's there's works that are just flawless and untouchable. But then, you know, he passed away. I think in '94, and they published a 400-page book every year since his death. That's well, that's of, the thing yeah. with Stieg Larsson. In in uh, Sweden, yeah. where they found some of his papers, mm. and they're going to start publishing. Maybe they weren't so great. Yeah, yeah. You're, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. And um, I, personally, I would rather have you know even just five books in my lifetime published that are that are that are really um, can stand on their own and are you know really well put together than than every little note to a girlfriend or something that but they you know, find in But my... that's true. Isn't that what we think? Yeah. We think that if we can delve into the psyche of that of that writer, and even if he wrote a note to his girlfriend, it's got to be fantastic. Yeah. Just like every piece right. of art somebody yeah. paints. <laughs> well, tell us about Empty the Sun. I think you're here to talk about that. Empty the Sun uh, is a novel about a um, ace guitar player who loses the index finger of his fret hand. Oh, I got it. And and <laughs> it, he can't play anymore and he kind of kind of spirals him into this really dark place and he's befriended uh, by this esoteric old man who who subsequently dies and to sort of bring meaning back into the the main character's life. He, he tries to solve the mystery of this old man's past and it it culminates in a shotgun fight with God. Like and the, like 20 the, faces. the author, Jerry Stahl, whom you've done book signings and readings with, uh, says that you write like a guitar player with 19 <laughs> fingers. <Yeah>. That <laughs> so that's little, what the yeah, yeah. finger is gone, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, uh, how'd you get together with Ben Chesney? Uh, ben Chesney, um, who did the soundtrack, the book comes with a soundtrack. I know, that's what's um, so great. I'm going to show the... <laughs> and um, right. as far as we know, it's one of the only um, times a, a soundtrack has been scored for a book. So it's really so it's music. Written, it's yeah. music written for the novel, um, kind of like you would score a film, I guess. Um, and Ben Chasney is a <laughs> friend of mine who coincidentally I think is one of the most interesting artists alive in America today. And he is an ace guitar player. And um, Beyond, and he has 20 fingers? He, he has 10 solid ones. Um, <laughs> it's, they're all there. And, uh, and he uses every one of them to um, a really heightened level that I, I respect. And, um, so he plays and on this. So he, yeah, he's the, he, he and another um, guitar player named Steve Rucker, who's also an ace guitar player, it's them two um, doing the soundtrack. So, so he made this happen. He, did he read the book? Did um, he go along with you? Or? We were just up late one night. Um, I, I, we've been having this ongoing dialogue about art for years. And, um, you know, these late night 3 right. a.m. Yeah. talks or phone calls and deconstructing all these ideas. And um, one day we just both kind of said, who's ever done a soundtrack to a book? Oh, fantastic. And, and I had been mulling around this character. Um, the the book is is fiction. It's not autobiographical right. so much but I did um, I did get the end the tip of my finger bit off by a dog oh a bear not a bear a dog. <laughs> but it's uh, in one of your books it's a bear <laughs> isn't it and they, yeah and they um, and it was sewed back on and and it, it, so I'm lucky um, but if the, if it would have been worse I could still type and I started thinking well who what artist uh. really needs that or it's going to destroy oh, their art they form. They can't have a lot they can't have a career. Yeah. And um, and so I had started working on that character and when I told Ben about it, 
it was just the perfect kind of because of the music connection and everything. Who is the Amigo? The Amigo Hotel. Um, is, That's a big plays a big part. Yeah, it does. It's a uh, it's based on this little zone downtown near uh, First and Vignes. Oh. Um, I used to live down there back again before off ramp. Yeah, Vignes. <laughs> yeah, but it's um. It used to be just this weird little industrial zone that had a place called Al's Bar. Oh yes, of course. Yes, and the and, and the <laughs> First, hotel above but, Al's yeah. Bar, mixed oh. with a couple of those other ones. I had lived in some of them, and uh. so I kind of made an, an amalgamation of them to I be see. the Amigo, the Amigo Hotel, yeah. and then and that's where Hal, the the old guy that kind of saves the protagonist from death, destruction. Um, that's where he lives, and it's so he's embodies the amigo as well the amigo yeah. <laughs> and before we leave uh i was watching this uh video of you and jeff garland called the showdown yes. are you an actor at uh, any other time than just this video no um no i've never i've never acted um, how did that come about who wrote it that came about uh jeff and i are, are friends just through literature actually he's a he's a avid reader um devours books and we kind of we just met um, mm. as fans. Of, but of you reading. guys look alike. It was like and the showdown. <laughs> so we have um, Empty the Sun, we have Courting the Jaguar, and we have the showdown, yeah. which is like your first debut. Yeah, that's my acting debut. Yeah. Thank you so much, <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Joan. I really appreciate it. I'm so glad you were here. Thank and you. thanks for watching the Joan Quinn profiles. Please keep emailing me at j a q u i n n one at aol.com. And I'm still getting your letters at 777 regular letters, not emails. 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90019. See you next time.